Right, so um, uh, we were um, 18, I used to be in Oxford and then 18 years in Cambridge and then about a year ago um, decided um, to move to Oxford to um, uh, an environment um, that, that will be and is much more suited to what, what we want to do in type 1 diabetes. Our, our goals are to treat and prevent it. The only drug prescribed for type 1 diabetes is insulin. And there are 35 years of failed trials uh, making almost no prod, uh, uh, progress in, in type 1 diabetes therapy. Um, it's a worthwhile goal because even in, in, in cases of type 1 diabetes where it's just diagnosed or even a decade later, there's lots of beta cells left and there's lots of beta cells left to save. And yet we haven't worked out a single way of saving them. And you don't need to save much a fraction of normal uh, insulin secretion uh, will probably prevent all the, the, the terrible complications that happen later in, in the life of a, of a type of a diabetic of type one and type two. Uh, so um, the, the other feature of our research is the sustained funding from uh, a partnership between this diabetes charity and the Wellcome Trust. Um, uh, now, interestingly, um, uh, this this was the lab that I left in Cambridge, and most people um, stayed in Cambridge, and, and have, um, all, all, everyone found a new job um, in the NHS and in other groups. And and I left behind some really really good people. Um, uh, the people in red circles are people that actually moved um, o over to um, the the new group in Oxford, including my um, uh, long standing co PI. Um, uh, um, Linda Wicker um, and, and again another vital feature of it's not just the sustained funding but it's the continuity of people um, in the lab and um, you, you guys will understand this it's continuity of data uh, continuity of analysis continuity of methods and SOPs and we and we put all of that in place over the last uh, 20 years and, and all of that has been transported and all the funding to, to Oxford um, and we're, um, I haven't put the photograph, but we're now recruiting the new team. And the upside of that is I can recruit the skills that I actually need uh, to what we're doing now. Um, and I'll tell you what we're doing. Um, it used to be all about DNA. Actually, it's going to be DNA again. But now it's experimental medicine studies and, and lots of immunology. And that's really what we've been doing for the last 10 years. We We haven't we have a residual genetics effort. Um, having said that, everything we do in biology of diabetes and the human immune system, it always goes back. It must be relevant to the human genetic findings that we we, we never vary from that because we want to be in an etiological, um, potentially causal environment. Um, so this is uh, the new home. It's the Wellcome Trust Centre for Human Genetics. And the, the funny thing is that I, I was one of the founders of the centre and left before this, uh, left Oxford before um, this building was. So it was me, Mark Lathrop and John Dell put the grant into the Wellcome Trust um, uh, for the bricks and mortar of, of this centre. And um, the, the, the campus in, in Oxford is, is transformed largely due to John Bell um, uh, and there are lots of institutes that surround this building that weren't there 18 years ago. And it, it really is a, a fertile environment to, um, to do the research we want to do. And they're, they're, gonna, they're putting another building up next door in one of the last slots on the site in Headington in, in Oxford. And, and Nova Nordis are going to have a couple of floors on that site. But meantime, they're going to move into our building as people move out to the big data institute which I think is uh, led by Gil McVean, which I think is just about to open. Um, uh, so interesting times. So it, it'll be interesting to see how we interact with um, 100 Nova Nordisk employees. And can we really make it work? And I, I'm, I'm going to be really keen to help it make, make it work. They're interested in obesity and type 2 diabetes. But I'm going to tell you today that I think there's a, a really incredible link between those and, and type 1 diabetes, all, all revolving around um, the pancreatic beta cell. So um, immunobase is something that we set up um, 
to show summary uh, genetic and biology information. Um, Ollie Byrne in Cambridge, who stayed behind in Cambridge to finish off his PhD with Chris Wallace, um, was the leader of that effort. And, and I'm afraid immunobase is, 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 is dysfunctional at the minute. It's in hibernation. And I need to recruit two or three people to bring it out of hibernation and make it functional again. It's lost a lot of its functionality. But as a tool, um, I still use it pretty much every day. And when it was fully functional, I used it all the time. And I, I've discovered some really amazing things using um, immunobase and before T1B base. And we want to bring it up again and, and make it useful. Uh, databases are really hard to curate and keep up. Um, so we had four people in Cambridge full time. Um, tools are easy compared to databases. And, and I'm, I'm not underestimating what it'll take to, to get it back up again. But currently, where we left it, um, this is touch screen. That's interesting. Uh, how do I get rid of that guy? Sorry. It's not end show, is it? Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so, um, Curly is 57 of, uh, regions in the genome, and um, for about a third of them, we've named candidate genes. And of course, we've named the candidate genes based on immune response genes. Um, but And some of those candidate genes, for a variety of immune are almost certainly one of the causal genes in, in the region. Uh, in the region. Um, uh, the HLA is, um, uh, has got a massive effect. And the reason for that is that there is a whole set of susceptibility alleles and there's a whole set of protective alleles. And in the middle, there's a whole set of alleles that are neutral. And the two combined result in this massive risk um, bestowed by this HLA region. And years ago, we fine mapped that to the HLA class 2 and class 1 molecules through antigen presentation. And uh, the most striking thing about this is the protection by one particular allele called DQ6. And we, we still don't know why, why it's protective, but if you could understand um, why 20% uh, of us who carry this allele are almost completely protected from type 1 diabetes, and you could mimic that uh, by pharmacologically um, or, um, or otherwise, um, you, you could prevent type 1 diabetes, but we still don't understand why and how DQ6 is protective. The, the, um, and... Um, I, I was one of the people that discovered that um, uh, almost, um, well, 29 years ago. And owing to technological advances in the last few years, um, including next-gen sequencing, um, this paper came out last year um, beginning to get the answer of, of, of why um, uh, HLA is associated with a whole variety of diseases, including type 1 diabetes. And, and basically, we, we had to wait almost 30 years to be able to sequence um, the T cell receptor repertoire and link that to is the T cell receptor repertoire all these millions of variable sequences is uh, is that um, catalog of sequences in us is it associated with specific HLA types and and um, this is Jonathan Pritchard and Chris Garcia got together and and that uh, it's really fantastic paper um, what what I want to do in Oxford is really dig into this. In a, in a very clinical, co a, co a beautiful clinical cohort that we have the samples for and, and actually say, well, what part of the repertoire is missing with DQ6? So the autoreactive T cell sequences are missing. Uh, that's the model. And what ones are more prevalent in the most predisposing genotype? Um, all the methods previously for TCR sequencing were rubbish, um, but the latest tr PCR tricks um, allow you to sample the millions of TCR sequences that, that's in, in your repertoire. So it, it is funny, the, 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 other, uh, the next major gene is the insulin gene itself, a promoter polymorphism that alters its expression um, in, in the pancreas, but most importantly in the human thymus. And we've known that for years. In fact, the association was found by Graham Bell in 84. And um, Immunologists are, have a willful blindness to genetic results. This result and the mechanism of thymic expression and immune tolerance to insulin is really cast iron. I'm not exaggerating here. It's, it's wholly accepted. And it, what it means is that the primary autoantigen in, in type 1 diabetes is the insulin 
um, molecule and its precursors and modified forms of it. And yet we still debate, oh, well, there's four or five antigens and which one is it? But it, clearly this is, this is the primary one. Um, and I'll show you uh, auto, uh, a graph of, of autoreactivity to this molecule early in life later in the talk. Um, so there's a huge effort to induce antigen-specific tolerance in, in cases. And, and people are worrying about which antigen, but this is the antigen. And actually, most of the effort is directed towards uh, trying to bolster uh, tolerance to insulin and its precursors and peptides from it. Um, um, and um, the, but the genetics, it, help, it really points you in that direction. So linked to that um, basic genetic observation, <laughs> is a move from my collaborators, Annetta Ziegler and Ezio Bonifacio in, in, in Germany, Munich and, and Dresden, to carry out a randomized control trial in newborn babies uh, by feeding them insulin um, to see if by feeding as much insulin as possible, um, can, can we, like um, uh, they have done with peanut allergy, can we prevent the anti-insulin autoimmunity in children in the first years of life? Um, and um, I'm going to expand a little bit on that. Um, uh, so this whole study is going ahead gangbusters in Germany. Um, the funding has been obtained. The insulin has been obtained, 50 kilograms of insulin. Um, and uh, it's essential that the UK and Germany combine because we need to genetically test a lot of children each year. And... and um, I, uh, the leaders in this are, as I said, are Aneta and, and Ezio, and, um, and I've made the connection with Hemsley, who are the people that left millions, zillions to uh, a dog trust, um, and that was rescued by the lawyers and put into a charitable trust called the Hemsley Charitable Trust out of New York, and uh, half, one side of the family has type 1 diabetes, so they want to, to prevent type 1 diabetes, and the other half of the family has inflammatory bowel disease. Um, but Hemsley are determined to um, uh, make this their um, niche. So um, uh, I, I had a connection with Hemsley, and I said the people that really mean business here are um, in Germany, and, and, and it's followed on. Um, it's going to be multiple countries. So next up is Sweden, and we, we all go to Sweden next week to have a meeting to discuss how everybody's getting on, with because each country will have different solutions to um, uh, recruiting uh, these um, uh, uh, newborn children in, and, and families into the study. Um, it's, it's a platform. So eating insulin won't be the only um, uh, primary intervention that people come up with. So, um, you know, one that's been tried in, in asthma recently, um, uh, and, and it was somewhat bungled, a uh, guy um, um, called Scott Weiss in, in, in Boston, um, was it was vitamin D and giving it during pregnancy and, and seeing if there's an effect on, on, on endophenotypes or wheezing in asthma. So that was published and um, um, except and there could be other environmental exposures. So people talk about um, probiotics and, 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 and microbiome. So the, the, the platform has to be robust enough um, that other interventions can be carried out, and, and probably not only for type 1 diabetes. So other diseases that a uh, genetic risk score in cord blood um, or, or heel prick drug at birth, um, and, and then say, well, here's a really safe intervention, which could be behavioral, or it could be uh, something as extreme as eating insulin or adding insulin to a baby's yogurt. Um, they want to start the trial in, in 2018 in, in Germany. Um, and certainly in the UK, we probably won't be ready by next year because we want to do a feasibility study. Um, as I said, it's, we, we want to follow a, a bit like UK Biobank within the realms of um, uh, all, all the uh, ethics and informed consent that we fully understand. But, but we want it to be... Um, a platform, a, a, you know, access like UK Biobank. We want it to be sustainable and, and, and to really make an impact, not just on type 1 diabetes, but um, a, a, a major health and, um, uh, outcomes. Um, so um, 
And so they're now that I've set this up, it's called Frederick, and um, it's a, uh, they want to collect 5,000 um, families in Saxony and go through the entire process of testing for type 1 diabetes genetic risk, which you can do with a genetic risk score of about 20 SNPs, and that's well worked out. And most of the risk is obviously HLA. And uh, they, they, they manufactured their own cards, and so they're not using the official Guthrie cards. They're, they're getting their own cards, um, and they're using the British company LGC to extract the DNA and, and do the SNP genotyping. Um, and, and all of that has worked. I was in Munich a few months ago, and it's pretty in. Uh, largely, they're using Helmholtz funding. Um, so this is um, this unbelievably, and the acceptance rate is pretty high for parents to say um, it's 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 about fifty percent to say yeah we're interested uh, in this possibility of of adding insulin to the uh, uh, neonatal diet. Um, uh, they've involved uh, government, uh, local, and federal. Um, uh, and, and, and of course, different countries will be very different on how you take, um, how you approach that. Um, so, um, so this um, this is the um, incidence of of diabetes uh, versus age of zero conversion, um, um, which means if you develop two or more autoantibodies. By age three, you're basically a pre-diabetic, and in fact, the field is trying to restage the disease and say, you know, if you've got double or more autoantibodies persistently, you're actually a, a, a diabetic in waiting. And the recent evidence is that that's absolutely the case. Um, once you're autoantibody positive within the first two or three years of life, you've got a 10% risk of being diagnosed with the disease every year for the rest of your life um, and we call that progression and we don't understand progression either um, it's probably to do with aging and various environmental exposures which could be anything vitamin d deficiency viral infections it could be anything um, so um, as i said um, th there's a terrific study in, in in the us called teddy which is a natural history study a birth cohort of thousands of children and uh, identifying children at risk and then measuring them routinely for uh, the appearance of autoantibodies and, um, and, and working out all the genetic, environmental and phenotypic factors that contribute to autoantibody production. And, and a bit like UK Biobank, everyone's waiting for the Teddy results and they're going to follow those children out to age 15. It costs about a couple of million um, dollars from NIH. But here is the um, insulin autoantibody, and the peak incidence is, is actually at about um, uh, 9 to 12 months of age. Um, uh, other autoantibodies are important, so GAD is, is another one, and it peaks at 4 or 5 years of age. But you can see that the primary autoantigen and the autoantibody together, um, even at six months, 20% of the kids are autoantibody positive against the insulin molecule. Um, so this, this is the antigen to try and promote um, neonatal tolerance. Um, we, of course, are following in the coattails of peanut. Um, so um, if you give enough peanut and notice uh, six grams, um, and we're at a much lower level. So one of the criticisms of our RCT is we're not giving enough insulin. But we don't want to give too much in case there's some effect on metabolism, even though you're eating it. Um, but this is um, this is one of the really fantastic papers uh, from uh, Gideon Lack and colleagues, where they showed that if you can give enough peanuts, um, you you can uh, protect from from peanut allergy. And now the health recommendations is you you give your baby as much peanut as possible. And and I think. In general, we're going to see peanut allergy, um, you know, come down owing to this and other research, um, and, and so we're taking exactly the same approach with insulin. Uh, Etsy and Aneta have done quite a lot of work beforehand, uh, so the, the the trial next year is called Point, but um, they've done two or three studies in in, in children. 
um, it called prepoint to um, assess well what's the immunology um, does oral insulin um, at these levels from uh, dose escalation from two megs to um, 67 and a half megs do, does it actually affect the immune system in a way that would be protective and a protective immune system would simply have more T regulatory cells suppressing the immune autoimmune response to insulin and um, uh, they've, they've done they've published this study and then they're doing a, they're in the middle of another one um, with a larger number of children and children who are younger um, Uh, this is some immunology, um, and this is just um, s some of this is published, and, and there's another paper just come out in Science Translational Medicine from Etzio, and and basically when you give the 67 and a half milligram dose to this small number of children, and you analyze autoreactive T cells against insulin at the single cell level um, by um, gene expression. Uh, the ones with the highest dose occupy a distinct position on the on the PCA, um, and they're going to repeat. They're in the middle of repeating this in a larger number of children. Um, so this is evidence that the the drug uh, at that level um, by oral delivery can affect the immune system in the right direction in in a in a, um, a, a potentially a therapeutic way, um, and. They won't get the results from the, the, the current prepoint until next year. Uh, if it falls flat on its face, it's going to be a, a problem. But if it looks as good as this and better, then it, it provides the underlying immunological rationale. Uh, there's nothing wrong immunologically with this rationale. Um, there are naysayers against oral tolerance, but we must be tolerant to, to food yeah. peptides and, and, and microbial peptides um, and and this period of life is the time to to try and use those neonatal tolerance mechanisms uh, in this way to promote uh, tolerance to insulin um, so this was some conclusions um, it looks as if uh, uh, daily exposure to oral insulin does affect the immune system um, uh, there was no evidence of metabolic effects, obviously crucial. The insulin gets digested up into peptides that can get across into the gut immune system. And, and then they currently go, go younger and, and establish with even greater confidence the safety of this. Um, and as I said, the, the current study is now 44 children, not half a dozen, and a dose escalation. And they've recruited everyone. Um, it's high risk children uh, for type 1 diabetes uh, genetic risk um, and they don't have the autoantibodies already and uh, hopefully we'll get the results of that next year and there'll be so as it's in this slide which is a few months old they had 39 of, of the 44 um, recruited um, so this is this is this is the beard study point um, uh, primary oral insulin efficacy, a, a standard ran, randomized control trial, but based on a 10% genetic risk of type 1 diabetes. I've, I've been saying um, we're actually going to, they're going to measure every year autoantibody testing out to six years. Um, uh, most of the action is in the first three years, but there's more power to be gained if we go out to six years. Um, uh, the bad news is it requires um, randomization of, of over a thousand um, children to a one to one placebo um, insulin um, RCT. And uh, uh, that requires screening of uh, in multiple countries of um, a total of um, probably 400,000. So if we could get um, uh, screening and participation um, in Germany, UK, Sweden, and maybe a couple of other countries, and we could get up to 100,000 a year uh, over a two or three year period, it might be manageable. And I know you're sitting there thinking this is completely nuts, um, but, and it probably is, um, but uh, with the funding in place and the drug in place um, and um, the organizations that are now present in these countries, um, things have moved on. Um, in the last 20 years, it, it could be achievable. Uh, and one, a big reason I came here today was um, when we do the genetic tests for type one risk, 
only 2% of those cord bloods will, will have the 10% the risk. So what are we going to do with the other 98%? And, and I've come here today to get ideas of what you could do um, in, a, in a way that doesn't destroy our ability to recruit for type 1 diabetes. But it, it's like um, ALSPAC, but on a, on a whole national basis. Um, uh, and, and all sorts of things could be, could be done with the other 98%. Um, and, and you can't read this, but the, there's a whole um, series of steps in this, um, um, and, and we've done the numbers and the stats, and, and they are as frightening um, as I showed in the previous slide. So moving quickly to, um, we're, we're still really interested in, in identifying the causal genes in each of our regions, um, and, and this is a major effort of um, uh, omics, gene expression, um, the two platforms that are really come online now is a proteomics platform called Somologic, um, based on a technology called Aptomers, that um, little DNA um, tags that bind proteins from Larry Gold. And I was very skeptical, but I've now seen enough data that they probably can measure the concentration of over 3,000 proteins in 60 microliters of serum. And the costs of that will come down. And the other platform that I think is, is, is more advanced and more widely used um, than, than Sumologic is um, uh, the, plat the metabolite, low molecular weight metabolite platform from Metabolon. And, and all those platforms are, are uh, it's providing an avalanche of uh, mechanistic uh, information about uh, what might be causal and how uh, genes might be causal. Um, so, and um, the idea is that if you can get a, identify uh, pathways um, that are genetically validated, um, there may be opportunities to repurpose drugs that are already in use and safe with no side effects, particularly drugs that have been in children, and, and put those into type 1 diabetes depending on what the human genetic results are. Um, talking about everything's driven by technology, so again, we've waited years for this. Now, genome-wide, you can connect up uh, promoter regions with regions of the genome that enhance the expression of those promoters. Um, and uh, this is called chromosome conformational capture. And uh, it's, it's very simple in, in that you, um, uh, using formaldehyde, you cross-link these enhancers that loop around to help um, drive uh, promoter expression um, of genes that could be two megabases away. And, and this is a this is a, a yet another revolution in trying to identify the um, uh, causal genes. Now, they, um, this was a paper from Peter Fraser. Um, our lab had a role in it, particularly Chris Wallace and Ollie uh, Byrne. Uh, it's just come out in Cell, and there's um, a supplementary table three in there um, where um, they they did uh, chromosome capture on 17 different human primary subtypes from blood and and we our contribution to the cells and addition to the analysis was resting t cells and activated t cells and the change in conformation loops between when you activate a t cell and you can observe um play with that in a tool that ollie made called chickpea um you the interaction change and in activate with four hours it's just amazing to switch back and forth and then Look at how that differs in different uh, blood cell types. Um, so that that just came out, and our our paper on T cell activation um, is sitting in bioarchive, and uh, we're um, trying to get it into um, a, a journal. So one of the um, one of the findings among dozens of findings in that that supplementary table, it's it's like a gold mine of of it's going to take us years um, to follow the, those results up. Um, so one of our uh, really fine peaks was uh, in the in this gene renal is an absolutely crap candidate for type one diabetes. Um, and lo and behold, when you look at the conformational data, um, the SNPs in this gene loop around to the promoter of a much better candidate gene called P10, and it it's outside the region of LD. Would never have thought about it. And several of the new candidate genes are even a megabase away. They're, 
we, in, in Minobase, we had a half megabase window. Um, so, uh, and, and also some of the genes are quite close to the peak of association, but they're not immune response genes, so we, we wouldn't have paid them any attention. Um, and, and P10 is a very famous gene, probably not a terribly attractive uh, therapeutic target, uh, given its effect on, on cancer, IBD, and type 2 diabetes. So one of the big obvious pathways that came out of um, the, the, the genetics of type 1 diabetes with the IL-2 pathway so some of the major molecules like the receptor, the ligand itself, um, are associated with type 1 diabetes risk. And we, um, uh, <coughs> IL-2 is av available um, off, off, off licensed drug um, uh, called Prolucan or Aldazlucan. It's as cheap as chips. It's used in cancer therapy at very high doses. And a few years ago in New England Journal of Medicine, there was a proof of concept where two groups with two different immune diseases showed that um, low dose IL-2 had clinical benefit in uh, vasculitis and in graft-versus-host disease. Um, what we decided, this was published a few months ago from our group, what we decided to do was go right back to the beginning and um, ascertain, uh, uh, all the results are in this PLOS Medicine paper, ascertain what one dose of IL-2 does and what the pharmacokinetics and the pharmadynamics are in, in an experimental medicine study of 40 patients with recently diagnosed type 1 diabetes. It wasn't a clinical study, it was a mechanistic study in those patients where we threw every omics and, and phenotype method that we could and that we could afford to do to really measure the uh, response to uh, extremely low doses of interleukin-2. And we, and, and we did a, a dosing study with an adaptive design um, uh, with Adrian Mander at the MRC Biostatistics Unit. And ad the adaptive design simply means um, in outline that we give a dose of, um, um, uh, of IL-2 and, and we looked at all the results and within a week, based on those results and a statistical model of, of the results, we, we, had a, we met again to say, well, which dose will we give next? We were narrowing in on the doses of IL-2 that would give um, a, a, a preset increase in Tregs, these suppressor cells um, of, of, that maintain um, immune tolerance. Um, so uh, again, technology uh, really brought this alive in that IL-2 up to this study had been measured at the picogram level of sensitivity, but actually its baseline levels are fentagram. And mesoscale, we don't know how they've done it. This company have invented a method to actually start measuring uh, plasma analytes at fentagram levels of sensitivity. And for IL-2, which is a short half-life, this is essential. So for the very first time, we were accurate, able to accurately measure the PK, the concentration in blood of the injected drug. Uh, so baseline of IL-2 is at the fentagram level. And after a few days, it, it returns to baseline with a single dose of IL-2. Uh, this dotted line is the um, amount of IL-2 um, that um, uh, the 0.01 units per mil of IL-2 is, is the amount of IL-2 that a Treg needs to get activated. Um, this uh, tenfold higher concentration, 0.1, is the amount of IL-2 that an effect or a bad T cell will get activated. And you can see that in this 90-minute time point, and even at day one, these ultra low doses have for a few hours the capability to not active or not only activate Tregs but also effectors. And this this profile of this is sub Q injection of the drug. It's sort of classic. Um, uh, so you want to think about smoother methods of delivery. Um, uh, when in other studies you add IL two and you measure the Treg frequency it goes up because Tregs love IL-2. They depend on it for their growth and expansion and function. And we got a really big surprise in the study because at 90 minutes on day one, this is a serial blood sampling each day, so longitudinal analyses are absolutely key. We discovered instead of going up in blood, they go down. And it, that's because they either get uh, the IL-2 cause them to be retained in tissues or the IL-2 causes them to exit from the blood and go to tissues, because injecting IL-2 is, is probably a danger signal. It's a, it's a part of normal immune response to infection. Uh, the other big surprise we got 
was uh, that uh, we expected IL-2 to uh, make the Tregs more sensitive, more suppressive, more functional. Uh, instead, we lost the sensitivity temporarily of Tregs to IL-2. The sensitivity dropped, and we worked out the explanation for that. Uh, the IL-2 receptor is three molecules, and one of them, called the beta chain, is the signaling molecule. And IL-2 temporarily removes the beta chain from the surface of the Treg, making them less sensitive to IL-2. And nobody ever thought of that before. Um, so it recovers by day two. It bounces back. Um, and this gives you some very vital information about how you deliver IL-2 on a regular basis. You wouldn't give it every day because you're desensitizing. Um, furthermore, as I showed you in the previous slide, the effects wear off by a week. So you wouldn't give it less, um, uh, less frequently than once a week. So you'd probably give it twice a week. Um, at the minute, in trials of IL-2 in a whole range of immune diseases, they start off by giving it every day at, at, at higher doses than, than we found. Um, so, um, and I think this kind of experimental medicine study uh, in a small number of patients um, where you're getting serial longitudinal data is, is um, a, a major way forward. I wanted to, I've included these two or three slides. Um, so in type 1 diabetes, obesity type, everything, the microbiome is the big bandwagon and people are sequencing uh, fetal uh, bacterial um, RNA and now gene expression. Um, but the, the, the approach that I wanted to take to the microbiome was actually um, using a gene associated with inflammatory bowel disease and type 1 diabetes. Uh, that's uh, the FOP2 gene. 20% of us are knocked out for that gene. And it, it had also been reported that it affects the microbio microbiota composition of, of the human gut. And um, I, I wanted to analyze um, with the new metabolite platform um, the association of FOP2 in a large number of individuals measured by the using the latest low molecular metabolite profile in collaboration with John Dinesh and Nick Wareham. And the preliminary results, uh, they've done the G-wash on this, um, is that, um, and this was a meta-analysis of the Dinesh and Wareham um, uh, metabolite results, uh, where they looked up the FOP2 genotype results, and, and Michael Epstein, who was in the lab, did the meta-analysis. And the, these, um, this is the susceptibility genotype, the homozygote susceptibility genotype. And some of these, um, three of them are uh, not identified yet, but likely come from the microbiome. Um, these, uh, some of these are, um, uh, most of them are second, the ones that are named, are either bile acids or secondary bile acids, uh, either um, from the host or from um, microbial um, metabolism. So I think a major way to analyze the effect of the microbiome is to measure the metabolites in the, in the host plasma or serum. Um, and so these, these metabolites in, in one way correlate with susceptibility and these metabolites on the other side of this uh, uh, plot um, which are, uh, again, um, secondary bile acids, which are signaling molecules. The, this is the protective genotype. So these, these, these uh, the elevated levels of these um, metabolites correlate with protection from inflammatory bile disease and, and, and type 1 diabetes. So that this could be a very downstream effect of this gene, FOP2. Um, what, what we're waiting for is the G-wash analysis of all this data. Um, and um, to see if other IVD or type 1 D genes are also associated um, with, with um, these metabolites uh, to give some specificity um, uh, to these, um, these molecules. Now, that's all immunology and classic modeling of type 1 diabetes. Um, but there's a huge elephant in the room, um, not just the, um, the fact that there's... Um, the classic model is we have to lose almost all of your beta cells to be diagnosed with a disease. And that, um, that, that general model is probably is no longer tenable. Um, so when people increasingly are looked at, uh, at autopsy type 1 pancreas, they're actually finding that immune infiltrates are quite rare. Um, uh, they're often very patchy 
as I said, many patients have lots have have sufficient C peptide even years, even decades after diagnosis. And I told you about the 30 years of failure. And the, the, uh, the, uh, again, there's been a certain element of willful blindness here. But um, one possibility is that the autoimmunity is triggering a secondary process that's actually intrinsic to the beta cell that isn't an immune process. It started with HLA-driven autoimmunity, but then something happened to beta cells uh, intrinsically um, such that no matter what immunotherapy you'd throw at that, once that process that I call a, a beta cell degeneration had started, it, it might not be stopped by even an effective uh, immune therapy because it's a different pathway. So um, uh, the new model, and, and many of us are talking about this. Um, so I go back to immunobase and the human genetics. And... Um, there's only 57 regions mapped in the genome for type 1 diabetes, and there's only about 100 or so for type 2. Uh, those are polygenic diseases. There's probably at least 1,000 regions for each. So when we look at those 57 regions, that's, that is the major loci, but it's only a fraction of the information that we could generate from the human genome about the biology of the disease and the pleiotropy with other diseases. But the first and uh, finest example is this gene, GLIS3, on chromosome 9. It's a confirmed type 1 diabetes locus, but it's also a confirmed type 2 diabetes locus. Same SNPs, same direction, same everything. And um, what, what's also clear about this is, this is the only immune disease, um, type 1 diabetes, that's associated with this. All, all of the other diseases in immune base aren't associated with the GLIS3 gene. Um, which suggests that it maybe isn't the immune system that this gene is acting through. Um, so um, the finest work to understand the mechanism of common GLIS3 polymorphism has been done by Desio Ezerich in, um, uh, in Belgium. And he showed in a really um, uh, terrific uh, PLOS genetics paper that the GLIS3 variants affects apoptosis of beta cells. In, and, and obviously that's acting in type 1 and type 2 diabetes. So all of a sudden we have a firm human genetic connection between a causal gene called GLIS3, it's a transcription factor, and actually there's a binding site for it in the insulin gene itself. Um, a firm mechanistic and genetic link between the two forms of diabetes, zeroing in on the um, fragility or apoptotic capacity of, of the insulin-producing beta cell. Um, so this really came to the fore, uh, this uh, guy also in Belgium, in Leuven, Adrian Liston, a very fine um, mouse uh, immunologist. He discovered a form of diabetes in, um, in, in mice um, that has nothing to do with autoimmune diabetes. And he mapped the genes for that form of diabetes in mice by classic mouse genetics. And he mapped it to two intervals in the mouse genome and one of them contains GLIS3. And in Nature Genetics last year, he described all the follow-up experiments to, to say, well, what's GLIS3 doing? And it's to do with apoptosis. I wrote the news and views on it. And what, what was really amazing about Adrian's study and the inferences from it, it not only joined up the two forms of diabetes together, but also with beta cell apoptosis, agreeing with Desio Esser's work. Um, but... Uh, perhaps even more excitingly, he could mimic the effect of these um, diabetes genes with a high-fat diet in the mouse model. So a high-fat diet did the same thing as the predisposing alleles of the two, of the two genes, GLIS3 and, and the other locus in mice. So this was not only a link between type 1 and type 2 diabetes, but also diet, um, high sugar, high fat. Um, and um, that clearly obesity is a major risk factor for type 2, but there's emerging evidence, and it's perfectly reasonable to think that early diet is, a, is also a major factor in type 1 diabetes and, and beta cell fragil fragility, uh, particularly if, if you have autoimmunity against insulin and those beta cells. Um, and Adrian and I have expanded on this in a review that um, came out recently. So... Back to immunobase, and what other um, regions of the human genome are associated uniquely um, uh, 
uh, among immune diseases with type 1 diabetes. And um, uh, for various reasons, I was drawn to this region. And you can see there's no named candidate genes in that region because on chromosome 17, because there's no immune response gene. And, you know, we're, we're biased humans. So if there was no uh, immune response gene, we wouldn't have named a gene. Um, and, and I'd never looked at this interval. But because of a, a beta cell apoptosis talk I heard um, in April 2015, I looked at this interval using immunobase. Um, and uh, remarkably, this interval is one of the most famous intervals in, in the human genome because it contains um, the gene MAPT, microtubule associated protein tau. And there's a whole series of tauopathies that are caused by over uh, increased expression of tau in, in neurons. Um, it's all about neurodegenerative disease. Um, it's a major factor in cognitive decline in Alzheimer, and it's a major susceptibility gene in Parkinson's and many, many other um, uh, d diseases that are classified as tauopathies. Um, in type 1 diabetes, it's the same variant, same direction, same everything. Um, now, MAPT, it, that's brain, right? It's got nothing to do with the pancreas or the immune system. So what I did then is um, having made this link as I sat in a conference with my laptop, um, I started looking at the literature. And years ago, um, this group had, had actually published that in an insulin secreting cell line, they demonstrated convincingly tau expression. But bizarrely and characteristically of research, the whole observation was dropped um, nobody really followed it up. I mean, what is tau doing in, in an insulin secreting cell? Um, insulin secretory granules are exported out the cell along microtubules. They require microtubule function. Beta cells and their physiology and their protein secretion are like sister cells to neurons, which also have to secrete large amount of protein uh, 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 very, very quickly. So lots of genes that are uh, some specificity for a beta cell are also expressed in neurons because they're both under huge protein secretion stress. Um, so, and, and they actually said in this, in this paper um, that maybe the beta cells might be an extra cerebral site of tuopathy. So that was interesting. I was getting pretty excited. And then I found another paper, same year, not followed up. And in this case, they not only found... Um, phosphorylated tau, which is really dangerous because it's the phosphorylated tau that falls off the microtubule, maybe um, reducing microtubule function, but also um, free tau, phosphorylated tau, that's not fit, uh, firmly bound to a microtubule, can form the aggregates that are thought to be the first stage in the toxicity associated with um, tau aggregation. Uh, but not only did this group report that, but they it also... Um, beta cells also express beta amyloid, the Alzheimer um, uh, uh, peptide. Um, beta cells also secrete, along with insulin, an, a third amylogenic protein called IAPP or amylin. So here you've got the most protein secretion stressed cell uh, has to make millions of molecules of folded and cleaved insulin within minutes if you, it, when you eat a meal. And it's expressing three of the most potentially toxic proteins in the body. Um, so by now I'm getting really excited. And then we started doing our own Western blots, mass spectrometry, and uh, standard immunocytochemistry. This is human pancreas stained with three different antibodies to tau. And these little brown blobs are classic islets among a huge pancreas. I mean, that, you can see why the original guy called them islets. And islets are little bags, mostly of beta cells um, that make insulin, and alpha cells that, that make a, a, a glucagon, another hormone. Um, but they're mostly beta cells. And um, there's lots of tau antibodies that don't see tau. So it's, it's a nightmare, and the same is true of many antibodies and proteins. But these three um, are validated tau antibodies, and there's the negative control. So I'm going to blow up this picture of this little heart-shaped islet. Um, and this was worked by a postdoc in the lab, Sarah Howlett, um, um, and two others in the lab next door that uh, knew how to, all, all the difficulties in immunocytochemistry and immunofluorescence staining. This is a classic insulin staining that Sarah did. 
insulin stained in red. And, and this is this heart-shaped islet. And you can see all the beta cells staining. For, this is normal human pancreas. It's not diabetic pancreas. This is glucagon. In human, the alpha cells generally surround the beta cells. And this is glucagon stained in green. And the key experiment um, uh, now is, does the tau co-localize with the red or the green? Is it alpha cells or beta cells? And the, um, there's that blow up of, of the tau stained with horseradish peroxidase. And you can see that there's a complete co-localization of, I mean, there is some tau staining, but the co-localization between insulin and tau is almost complete. So this, I, this is unpublished. Um, this, this is a novel result, um, but clearly shows in real human pancreas, not a cell line, that tau is more expressed in a beta cell than an alpha cell. Um, and we're fever this is going to be one of our major projects in Oxford. And Oxford's a great place to do this because the diabetes centre there has Anna Gloyne, Mark McCarthy, Patrick Roseman, who are world experts in beta cell physiology. Um, and we've been working for the last year and a half on working out the mechanism of how tau might affect beta cells. Um, so who uses human protein atlas? It's um, It's... Yeah, your epidemiology people. It's a great database. They've made thousands of antibodies and verified them very uh, conservatively to every cell and tissue in the human body. So if, if you've got a favorite gene or protein, look it up here. And that was the next thing I did to see where else outside the brain tau was expressed. And it's clearly expressed in peripheral nerves very strongly. Uh, and obviously, but you know, when you look at the human protein atlas, um, it, you know, you can see which nerves and, and where. Um, there's a cell type in kidney that strongly expresses it. And, um, uh, and also muscle, myocytes also strongly express it. Um, and, uh, you know, God knows why, but we're going to find out. So more recently, um, I was led by Tau to this autoimmune disease that I'd never heard of or never studied. <laughs> And in a recent meeting of type 1 diabetes researchers, 500 of them in San Francisco, I asked that crowd um, when I gave my talk, how many have heard of this disease? And I think two people put up their hands. Um, um, and what's amazing about that is that this um, uh, inflammatory myositis that occurs in people over 50 <laughs> is an exact analog of type 1 diabetes. Um, uh, and uh, tau, uh, it's called inclusion body, and those inclusion bodies contain um, phosphorylated tau and other molecules associated with protein aggregation. And there's a fantastic review in New England Journal of Medicine about this disease. But they don't link it with type 1, and we never linked it back to uh, type 1 back to myositis. So the major model in type 1 diabetes is that these T cells kill beta cells. This is the major model for um, uh, IBM. Um, Oh, triggers, viruses, yes. Aging, yes. Um, abnormal protein homeostasis, absolutely. GLIS-3. Um, all type 1 diabetes. HLA, yes. Um, impaired autophagy, a way of clearing debris within a cell. All of those apply to type 1 diabetes and myositis. So we've got this literally parallel universe that never cross-connected. Um, and... Oh, they've got, we've got the same cytokines, exactly the same cytokines. Um, and then they've got this extra thing, they're ahead of us. They, well, maybe it's a misfolding disease. And then, um, as I said, there's, there's phosphorylated tau ubiquitin, which is trying to uh, recycle proteins. Uh, they've got stress and damage and this word degeneration. And then it's, it's very funny when you read it, they have a big debate. Oh, is it the inflammation first? Or is it the degeneration first? Which is it? It's so rare, this disease, they can't do G-wash on it. But G-wash distinguishes chicken and egg. So the G-wash of type 1 tells you it's an HLA insulin autoimmune disease, unequivocal, and particularly the HLA protection. Uh, any virus you get or lack of vitamin D, HLA will still protect you from, from that uh, environmental exposure. And it, it is funny, they, they, like we do in type 1, people debate, oh, well, it's inflammation, it's not degeneration. But, of course, it's both. Um, and in this disease, 
Uh, without the GWAS, we can't really tell, but my guess is it's probably aging and autoimmunity triggered, and then you get both the degeneration and the inflammation. Um, and in biology, it's almost always both, um, but for some reason, us scientists like to pitch your tent in one place and, and, uh, and slag off the other um, group, and that's a complete waste of time. I mean, we had a fantastic debate in human genetics about rare versus common variants. And I just thought the whole thing was like a waste of time because if we could sequence everyone in the UK, it wouldn't be a debate. We'd just analyze the data. Um, and we have, as usual, we have to wait for the technology. I had to wait 13 years to do GWASH. I, I just sat in Cambridge twiddling my thumbs. Um, um, I, well, I wasn't. I was collecting as many families and cases as I possibly could. Um, and amazingly, the funding agency said, well, you've got no technology, John, but we'll still fund you millions to collect the 10,000 cases that we eventually G-washed. Um, what, what factors cause uh, tau phosphorylation? And this is in the literature. Inflammation, hyperglycemia, both forms of diabetes, decreased insulin screen, chronic ER stress. Tau is, is a cause of, of disruption of ER uh, degradation of, of misfolded proteins and the inability of the unfolded protein response to deal with that. And of course, aging, uh, very bad for you. Um, so uh, I'm going to state the obvious now. People are calling Alzheimer now type th 3 diabetes. The major, a major risk factor for Alzheimer, totally unexplained, is diabetes. Um, and people, if you read the latest reviews, they say, well, it must be insulin signaling in the brain because neurologists don't think outside the brain. Why would they? Um, but a very simple explanation is that this is a, a system-wide um, uh, degradation or reduction in how to deal with amylogenic proteins, particularly in cells that are under huge protein <laughs> secretion stress. So a, a simple explanation for diabetes and Alzheimer is that that Alzheimer process in neurons is also kicking off in beta cells and other cells and causing a decrease in insulin secretion, insulin pulsatility. And um, the thing about tissues and andos, um, insulin secretion um, is highly pulsatile in response to glucose intake. <coughs> if it's not pulsatile and, and really active and physiological, cells get bored and they become insulin resistant. So um, the analogy that David Matthews in, in, in Oxford years ago told me <laughs> is that if I had a pipe between me and George and I leaked some ink down to it, um, some white ink onto his black shirt, probably wouldn't notice. But if I fired a pulse of ink down, he'd notice. Um, the first thing, he's bored. The second thing, he's, he's going to activate and the receptors for insulin or whatever are going to come up. And, and that's probably what's happening, um, I think, in the diabetes in Alzheimer's. Um, if, if tau is expressed in a certain cell type, and again, if you dig into the literature where you can find anything, um, there's a cell type in kidney that does express, and we're going to confirm this in Oxford, that does express tau. Um, that could be an explanation for diabetic nephropathy. Now, the GWASH in nephropathy has gone nowhere. Um, there's no therapy for nephropathy. People think it's a vascular problem. But maybe it's got something to do with protein trafficking and, and, and protein aggregation and these amylogenic proteins, including tau. And that's something we're definitely starting to work on in, in, in Oxford. And then the other major complication, um, uh, which usually we, we call it the diabetic foot. So di diabetics get numb feet and they get amputation. Uh, it's uh, neuropathy. And peripheral neurons are absolutely laden with tau. Um, so if you had hyperglycemia, your HbA1c wasn't very good. All along, you're, you're really encouraging these amylogenic events to occur. Um, and, and when they do aggregate, they're, um, not only can they kill the cell, and we, the neurological community, are working out those mechanisms, and now we are in beta cells and maybe ponocytes, but um, they can spread from cell to cell, um, probably in exosomes. And that might account for the patchiness seen in di uh, type 1 diabetes, diabetic pancreas. So inside an islet, once the process starts, it might destroy every beta cell in the islet. But what we observe is that islet next door is completely intact. And that patchiness would be, it could be explained by an in intrinsic process. Um, 
Uh, there's lots of other things. The top G wash hits in Alzheimer's, who would have guessed? Um, many immune response genes, including complement receptor, you know, what the heck? And we've made this, um, Marcin Pakalski, a postdoc in the lab, has found complement receptor all over T cells in humans. Again, totally unobserved. Um, so finally, um, if you want to prevent neonatal autoimmunity, you have to start early in life. Um, and you want to prevent the autoimmunity, but you want to make sure that you avoid any degeneration owing to that autoimmunity, the cytokines and the, the killer T cells. Um, and, and hence this first effort towards primary prevention. Um, if the autoimmunity is established, and that's the current immunotherapy trials, either in a double autoantibody positive kid that isn't diagnosed yet or a newly diagnosed case, notwithstanding it might be too late, I think we need combination therapy of um, controlling the autoimmunity and the degeneration, uh, promoting beta cell health. And uh, this has opened up a whole new um, way of thinking about therapy of type 1 in that um, why don't we look at how far the neurodegenerative people have got. Now, the bad news is they haven't got very far. So if you look at the latest reviews about neurodegenerative therapy, they're doing what we've done. They're just taking pot shots at it based on a lack of, of mechanistic and biological understanding. But there are, I mean, obviously a lot more money is thrown at neurodegenerative uh, therapy than type 1 diabetes. Um, but there are reagents and clues about what might work. And remember, for the beta cell, we don't have a blood-brain barrier problem. Most of the neurodegenerative fall at the blood-brain barrier, but we, we, don't, we have the advantage of not having that. Uh, barrier to cross. Um, there are also uh, many, uh, there are several drugs that, uh, some of which have been used in children to enhance uh, uh, protection from protein aggregation, to enhance chaperones and protein trafficking. And I went up to Birmingham recently on a similar mission to this, uh, more to do with the immunology. And uh, there's a trial going on on a rare disease called Wolfram syndrome. And they're using a drug that's been used for epilepsy uh, um, and uh, that that Wolfson syndrome, it's basically a rare form of diabetes. Um, and that drug could be immediately repositioned into diabetes type one and type two um, in the in a in a in the correct study to see if if enhancing uh, uh, um, protein secretion. What we'll do in Oxford is do all the preclinical work and beta cell lines to see which of those drugs are the best to protect you from. Um, tyopathy of beta cells, um, what dose, which drugs, which combination of drugs, and then do the first experimental medicine study in, in patients.